Wah, TV ya, sini. Hmm. What should I watch? Kamu. Breaking news, Jews and other minorities were to be completely cut off from society according to the Nazis. The violent repression and persecution of Jews and other minorities was a defining feature of the Nazi rule. While not the main focus of the Nazi dictatorship during its first few years, persecution began as soon as they took power and nearly never stopped. Under the Nazis, the Jews suffered the most persecution. The core of Nazi philosophy was incredibly anti-Semitic. In the years 1933 to 1938, more than 400 anti-Semitic laws were passed. Every aspect of Jewish life was governed by these commandments. The law for the restoration of the professional civil service, which was passed on April 7, 1933, was one of the first laws passed and prohibited Jews from working for the civil service. The law against overcrowding in schools and universities, which went into effect on April 25, 1933, soon after that, set a cap of 1.5% on the number of Jewish students who may enroll in German schools. On 29 September 1933, just for four months later, the hereditary farm law was approved, outlawing Jewish farm ownership and management. The Nuremberg Laws, announced at the Nazi Party annual rally in Nuremberg in late 1935, marked an escalation in the persecution of the Jews. Even if someone just had one grandparent who had converted from Judaism to Christianity as a youngster, the Nazis still considered anyone with Jewish roots as the Jewish. As a result, many persons who had never considered themselves to be Jewish or those who had stopped practicing Judaism were potential targets of persecution. Moreover, for the second Nuremberg law, the law for the protection of German blood and honor was created. This law prohibited marriages and sexual intercourse between Jews and Aryans, and they also banned the work opportunities of every woman who is under the age of 45 in Jewish households. These two laws sought to racially cleanse and protect Germans of true Aryan ancestry. The laws heralded the beginning of a new era of oppression in the Nazi Germany. In the 1930s, when the Nazi began their occupation of Europe, they set up ghettos for more than one million of Jews, forcing them to live and work in France of communities. Once the Nazi arrived at the final solution, the mass murder of Jews, most ghetto residents were killed. Some 25,000 of them, though, escaped the ghettos to hide in the woods, but few survived. The member of one family member who spent years in the forest are now telling their story. Thank you so much for being here. One of your family members survived the Holocaust. So, can you tell me a little bit about them and what they endured? Okay, sure. So, the Rabinowitz family was a normal family uh, in 1930s Poland. They lived in a very small town called Zutter and it was Maurice and Miriam were married and they had two young, very sweet and adorable daughters, Rocha and Tanya and they were basically just going about their lives. Uh, Maurice was a lumber dealer and Miriam owned a small shop and they were of course a Jewish family which ultimately as the 1930s would continue and as Germany's influence in Poland and the political started having a major influence, certainly that changed for the worse. Their fortune changed and they are sent, sent into the ghetto. And tell us about what their experience was like in the ghetto. So when the Germans invaded and they have uh, broke their peg with Russia in 1941, that's when things for uh, Zeta started to get really bad. Uh, all of the Jews of the small town in Zettel, they were interned in a ghetto and then the selection started. And what this means of course was that the Germans were separating of the Jews that could provide some sort of service 
were of some value in terms of labor or they were doctors or craftsmen or architects or engineers and the people who suffered most of them of course were small children without the parents the elderly the infirm and even just women who didn't have a working certificate but one thing uh, for these small communities in these small forests at different towns in Poland and Belarus and other countries uh, closer to Russia, one thing started to give them hope. And that was this idea that they could run away to the forest. And what was happening then was that the Soviet fighters who had been sort of behind enemy uh, lines at this point uh, were regrouping with uh, into guerrilla fighting units and they were slowly mounting this side fight against Germany and so these Jews in the ghetto not many of them were able to do it uh, but some of them did escape the ghettos and they did run to the forest and of course this is what had happened with the Rabinowitz family they were able to escape in August of 1942 uh, right during the most terrible thing that had happened in, to the Jews of Zittel which of course was the liquidation of the ghetto and when the Nazis basically killed all of the remaining Jews except for a very small number They end up in the forest and, and then tell us about what life was like there It was incredibly difficult for a number of years so uh, they went into the forest in the summer of 1942 and that the summertime was actually probably the most benevolent season of this area because the winters are absolutely brutal. The temperature dropped to about negative 20 degrees and I think during these winters that they were there and the family was there for two years it was even colder and of course they weren't safe in the woods as I think that they imagined they would be because there were still people, local groups, Poles and Lithuanians and others who had aligned with the German and the Nazis and were looking for partisan fighter but also Jewish family camps which is what the Rabinowitz family did. They formed a family camp and so they were constantly on the move. They built these small little communities in the woods, these underground bunkers that are called Semilanka and they basically made as much of life in the woods as they could but really it was just a day a day struggle to survive. And the fact that they did so, and they made it through, they spent several years traveling through Europe as refugees. Thank you so much for joining us today. Next. Hi everyone, it's Anur here from What's Up Malaysia. In this week's hottest movie release, we have a movie called Courage and it's just been released this week but it's already climbing up the movie charts. And what's even more interesting is that the director is another fellow Malaysian of ours and her name is Miss Sarah Idris. Hi! Hi all! So <laughs> excited to be here! Oh yeah, that's not nice. just... honor! Oh okay, that's <laughs> the energy that we wanted today. And yeah, Miss Sarah is the director of the movie Courage and um, you know, Miss Sarah, even though I'm really proud, you know, like having another mm -hmm. fellow Malaysian being a director, you know, embarking in the uh, industry film, but I want to know, like, what's the reason behind, you know, the reason why you directed this movie, lah, basically, because, you know, you took such a controversial approach by directing this movie. So, yeah, what, what's, what's the reason behind that? Yes, I think if I may say so, despite it has been many years since the horrifyingly wicked regime had happened, uh, living in this 20th century, I've seen that many of us were not aware of the situation happened back then and that uh, this should not happen. So as, the, as a director, I feel like it is my responsibility to preserve the history, the world history and portray this tragic event in the most respectful uh, way yeah. to the society yeah and in addition i think as a former law student so i think i get to go in depth and relate the uh, legal school of thought which is positivism with the nazi rule yes mm -hmm. 
Yeah, 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 that's very interesting. Like, who knows that you know our miss, our talented Miss Sarah is actually <laughs> a former law student. And speaking of um, law students, right? I'm sure that this movie in the future will be reviewed by other law students exactly, in the jurisprudence yeah, class. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I guess other than that, I want to know like briefly. Um, what exactly is the correlation between the positivist approach and also the Nazi rule? Yeah, first off, I would say that I'm no <laughs> expert, okay? But I remember back in my day in law school that I would do research with the help of my beloved lecturers. Mm -hmm. So what I can say is that legal positivists, they believe the question of what is the law is separated from what is the law is ought to be. So when they separate these two matters, it have they somewhat have expelled the morality and ethics from jurisprudence. So in application, we can see from the Nazi rule mm -hmm. where they implement the Nuremberg law, mm -hmm. which is very racial based and the Holocaust upon the Jews, mm -hmm. which is very tragic. And those what those are what happened lah back in those days. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. That's very detailed and you know very educational. The fact that you are able to apply this in your movie, basically, and um, you know, as a director of your movie, do you think that um, your movie basically is able to you know help the general public to understand better about these legal schools of thoughts? If you ask me, I would say of course, no doubt. I hope that that is the case lah because. Film and documentaries are not separate. They uh, should irritate, enlighten, and teach us, the public, something. Mm -hmm. And this is precisely the machinery of illusion, and which goes back to what I said before about the preserving the history and educating the public on jurisprudence. Because when the public get to analyze the legal positivist, which is the main school of thought, in the Nazi rule regime, they get to compare it with another main school of thought, which we know as the natural justice. Mm -hmm. So who knows, maybe one can be aspired, mm -hmm. spark interest into the legal field mm -hmm. yeah, by yeah. watching my film. Yeah, yeah that's, that's very <laughs> interesting. Yeah, I hope that you know, through your movie, you know, mm -hmm. there's others out there, especially like law students or even the general public, you know, there are inspired inspired to understand more about the history of Jews and stuff like that through your movie. So again, thank you so much for the interview, you know, taking your time out of your day to no come problem. here. Thank and you so much. Yeah, um, congrats on your movie premiere. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, Miss Sarah. And that's all folks for What's Up, What's Up Malaysia. And uh, stay tuned for the next week's episode. Bye-bye. Bye. Hello. Uh -uh. No, I'm just watching TV. That's a movie trailer lah. A new movie. The vibes is like Christopher Nolan-ish. It sounds good. Mm hmm. Oh? Really? Which one Oh. Bye. Bye. A very good day, I wish to all of you. Welcome to our jurisprudence forum for this week. My name is Sajani, your moderator for this forum. Before we start our forum in details, let me explain our topic today, which is imposing Nazis law upon Jews positive, positivism perspective. We have two expertise with us today. Our first expertise is Professor Nadia, a senior jurisprudent lecturer from University Kebangsaan Malaysia. How are you, Prof? Hi, Sajan, uh, Ms. Sajani. I'm good. And thank you for inviting me to share about our jurisprudence on this forum. I believe that this forum will bring, bring benefits to everyone. You're welcome, Prof. Our next panel is renowned lawmaker, Mr. Justin. How are you, sir? I'm doing fine. Thanks, Ms. Sajani. Well, without wasting our time, Let's hear the interpretation of legal positivism from the first invited panel. 
Okay, uh, thank you to Ms. Moderator. So first of all, there are so many version or interpretation of the legal positivism, but the most known or perhaps the, the famous one uh, would be the separation thesis. The main point of this thesis is that the law and the morality are conceptually distinct. Then under this separate thesis, there are uh, the other two types of positivism, which are the inclusive positivism and exclusive positivism. In inclusive uh, positivism, or also known as soft positivism, it is possible for a society's rule of recognition to incorporate moral constraints on the context of the law. Contrary to uh, exclusive positivism, that denies any morality into the law enactment. So uh, that's my explanation or introduction about the positivism. Thank you, Pro, for the great explanation. Can you explain about the legal positivism according to the Nazi law? All right. Um, Nazi law was a clear example of positive law in action, specifically for exclusive positivism. All those immoral laws and criminal action of the Nazis against against the Jews were legalized. John's Austin Common Theory was utilized by the defense during the during the Nuremberg trials, while some of the Austin legal positivism theory were rejected by the Nuremberg. One of the most key conceptions of the positivism was retained, which is that the law does not necessarily need to be linked to morality. By the time of the Nuremberg trials, it can be seen that the legal positivism effectively replaced natural law as the dominant jurisprudence philosophy. The tribunal's commitment to positivist conception of the separation of law and morality can be seen in the way that they respond to the Nazi defense arguments. To the positivist, an evil, an evil legal system can still be treated as legal system without in any way implying they have moral value. Its attempt to separate law and morals were normatively attractive but was analytically weak and it not only offered no theoretical legal resource for the people to resist Nazis' rule, it may even have played some role in legitimizing it. That's all uh, from me. So I pass back to our moderator. Thank you. Hearing from Prof. Nadia explanation of legal positivism regarding Nazi law. Now, I'm curious that how it will be in a, another perspective from our lawmaker, Mr. Justin. Can you explain on that? Sure, Ms. Moderator. So, good day, everyone. Now, I will be discussing about the application of legal positivism, particularly in the process of lawmaking. Um, so, based on Austin Common Theory of Law, the core of law lies on the concept of sovereign, command, and sanction. And this simply means that any violations of the command issued by the supreme political superior or the sovereign is an infraction or subject to sanction. And this is why we have prison, penal code, as well as code, where it is all about the command theory of law. Okay, now I get a clear picture of legal positivism. Now, Mr. Justin, can I know more about the rules of lawmakers in legal positivism? Yes. Well, according to Thomas Hobbes and John Austin legal positivism, the state was being regarded as the creator and the enforcer of law, with the power to inflict an evil or pen in the case its desire is being disregarded. So, in other words, the law was being used by the state to lay down the rules of actions. By applying in our present case, Nazi law can be regarded as positive law where it was a rule of actions used by the Nazi regime, even though it is morally long at first instance. I see, Mr. Justin. Does it mean that the state will have unlimited or absolute power to take any law that they prefer? Um, not really. 
uh, as even though the state has the power to make the law, yet according to John Austin, the exercise of the will of the supreme political superior by the government is not absolute. When there is a deliberate will of the supreme political superior in the exercise of governmental powers, the majority members of society may blunt, curb, or even deny by respond the adverse governmental challenges. Oh, may I know what is the method used to challenge the decision of supreme political superior? Well, basically, there are two types of methods. First is electoral response, which is a peaceable type by changing the lawmaker through elections. And the second one is revolutionary response, which is an outrooting type where uh, it happens only in the situation where the people are having spatial difficulties to check and contain the excess of force by the lawmakers. Hence, this explains the concept of legal positivism in the lawmaking of a state. That's really insightful, Mr. Jo Justin, regarding the lawmaker. Uh, dear audience, it seems that the time uh, envy of us, we, came, we come to the end of our forum. We would like to thank again to Professor Nadia and Mr. Justin for the insightful and interesting talk. Hopefully that uh, Nazi laws open juice in positive perspective will bring beneficial for everyone. Thank you.